Hello, good evening, and welcome to Military Images Live. This is Ron Coddington, the editor and publisher of Military Images. I'm here this evening uh, to uh, introduce our next episode. This is episode 10 in season two of Military Images Live. We're going to give uh, folks just a minute or so to get, uh, get to their screens and uh, get to their Facebook page and call up the program. Uh, we've got a couple folks coming on now. I see uh, Doug York. Hey, Doug. Uh, Jeff uh, is here. Michael is here. Fred Taylor is here. Other folks are coming in. Thank you for the thumbs up. I uh, hope you all had a, uh, oh, a lot of happy faces. Uh, thank you. And uh, welcome to the program. I uh, say so have other folks uh, coming in. Mike Werner from uh, Iowa. Thank you, Mike. I'm glad you're here. Gene, you made it. Fantastic. I know you got to see it in the uh, in the um, the archive version last week, so I'm glad that you're here live. Uh, Rick Wolf, my good friend from West Virginia, uh, Rich Mountain Battlefield is here. Uh, more folks are coming on, and I'm glad to have all of you here, uh, and I appreciate everything that you have done for military images and for the community of collectors. Uh, thanks for all the emojis coming through. And um, let's get started. I want to uh, begin tonight by uh, talking a little bit about Memorial Day, uh, which is uh, the time, of course, when we commemorate uh, all of our veterans who have fallen on battlefields and uh, in past wars. And um, I, I want to try something a little bit different this year. So on Facebook, we decided to have uh, 24 images, 24 profiles of soldiers, uh, one each hour beginning at midnight on Memorial Day and running all throughout the day. And uh, so we had all those and got a really, really great response. Um, I really appreciate all the kind words and all the thoughts as we had an opportunity to remember some of those from the Civil War generation. And as I was scrolling through the comments and looking through all of the uh, profiles and all the engagements, I thought it might be interesting to take a look at the ones that um, caught your attention um, the most. So uh, I'm going to, to do that now. I thought I'd take a look at the five um, images that uh, that caught your attention. And um, I think maybe they did so for a variety of reasons. Uh, this is the, the first image. Um, I hate to use the term most popular because it doesn't feel right at all here. It's not that kind of a moment and uh, it isn't that kind of a memory. But I do think that there's something to be said for the engagement to the stories. And so uh, this is the one that got the most attention on Facebook. Uh, the title was A Fallen Bucktail. That's from the Rick Carlisle collection. Um, this is a gentleman from the 149th uh, Virginia, or pardon me, Pennsylvania Infantry. Uh, this is Isaac Maul, and um, he fell on July 1st at Gettysburg, uh, the first day along the Chambersburg Pike. Uh, it was said of the regiment, it maintained its position with great heroism throughout the first day until the whole line retreated through town. Like many Union regiments that first day that were driven back through town, uh, many men lost their lives. Isaac Maul was certainly among those who did. Uh, the next image I wanna share with you, this uh, one was popular uh, uh, with folks for very different reasons. Um, this, uh, this one was titled First and Last Command at Antietam. It comes from the Ken Fleming collection. And uh, this is Richard C. Derby uh, of the 15th Massachusetts Infantry. Uh, they were line, uh, in line of battle and um, getting ready to uh, move forward. And um, according to uh, one historian, Derby, this is Derby here, turned to one of his subordinates, Second Lieutenant Walter Gale, as they approached the enemy. He asked Gale to attend to the men on the company's right while he looked to their left. Gale recalled what happened next. Quote, in a moment, heavy volleys were poured into our ranks and finding myself slightly wounded, I sought the shelter of a tree. While binding my wound, 
I saw the lieutenant cheering on his men in the most heroic manner. That's Derby here. It was a scene I can never forget. Two minutes later, he also was laid at the foot of the tree, fatally wounded in the temple. He was quite unconscious, apparently in almost a childlike sleep, and without suffering, he passed from life to immortality. The third image of the 24 that captured a lot of attention is uh, this hard plate image from the Fay and Ed Max collection. Uh, it's titled Grim Distinction at Gettysburg. Uh, this soldier, George Osmond, was a private in the 148th Pennsylvania Infantry. Uh, he was a, apparently a fun-loving guy. Uh, the quote about him, his personality, is uh, always in a good mood, no matter how arduous the duty, it was willingly and cheerfully performed. The historian added, I don't think he ever uttered one word of complaint. Now, think about your lives and folks that you know. I'm sure you know somebody like uh, Private Osmond, someone who was uh, doing their duty, doing their best, and doing it uncomplainingly. Well, he had a very sad fate uh, at Gettysburg near Cemetery Ridge on the second day. Uh, many of the men were taking a break in the heat of the day, waiting for their next orders, and Osmond, like a number of men, had fallen asleep. Uh, while he was sleeping, a cannonball uh, exploded, and um, it says here, George Osmond, who was no doubt in sleep, was hit by a spent shell, which struck him on the cartridge box. It was a terrible shock, uh, from which he did not recover, uh, which was uh, uh, shared with, by his nephew, Lemuel, who was in the same company. The fourth image is another Gettysburg story. And uh, this is um, uh, Joshua Garced, who was an officer in, uh, in the 23rd Pennsylvania Infantry. And um, what I found interesting about the story, and I think many of you did too, was his story takes place at the same time that Pickett's charge is going on, the roar of the cannon, all the fighting going on. Garced and the 23rd are behind the lines, and um, uh, there are stray uh, cannon fire that's coming their way during this time. And um, according to the regimental historian of the 23rd, it says, the rebel batteries kept up a tantalizing but irregular fire. One of the last shots, a shell from a Whitworth gun, struck Garced between the right shoulder and neck. The projectile literally tore him to pieces. So at the very end of the battle, here is Gar said behind the lines, not necessarily involved in Pickett's charge, and he is struck down by an artillery shell. The last image, uh, the fifth image of the group um, that folks found interesting, uh, it actually comes from my own collection, and um, it's titled The Brother of a General Falls in Battle. Uh, this is Hiram Banks. Uh, you know that last name, Banks. His older brother was Nathaniel P. Banks. Um, Hiram, who was pictured here, uh, was a second lieutenant in the 16th Massachusetts Infantry. Uh, during the Second Battle of Bull Run, he met, he met, he met his end uh, when a bullet um, struck him down. Apparently, when he was struck, it happened uh, nearby his brother, another brother, Gardner, um, who was in command of the regiment. So you have one brother, Hiram, who was lost. Um, literally within uh, a very close distance of his brother. And that again was at the second battle of Bull Run. So um, based on your uh, interest, uh, I'm sure that we will be trying another experiment like this uh, in the future. Speaking of the second battle of Bull Run, uh, I wanna share this story with you. Um, this image comes from the Rick Carlisle collection. And um, for those of you who are subscribers to the magazine, uh, the next issue, by the way, uh, went to the printer this morning. So uh, it should be uh, um, available in the next few weeks. And uh, one of the stories, and I'm going to tease to it here, uh, just because I found it um, quite interesting, um, is this gentleman pictured here. His name is Benjamin B. Hart. And um, he is a private in the 24th New York Infantry. Uh, before researching his life and service, what I found uh, 
peculiar to say the least, was that here is a private and he had, he made no higher rank. He's a private and he's posed here with a pair of binoculars, a binoculars case, uh, which is a little uncommon um, for a soldier of that rank. So uh, in doing a bit of research, I found um, that he posed uh, um, for this photo um, near a place called Upton's Hill, uh, which is uh, around Arlington, Virginia. It's literally about a mile and a half from where I'm talking to you right now, if that, um, Upton's Hill. And um, this is where Benjamin B. Hart made a name for himself uh, as a first class scout. Um, for his entire division in late 1861 and 1862. Uh, according to a newspaper article that's datelined from Upton's Hill, uh, he, uh, quote, won by his daring and valuable services, a handsome compliment from his regiment. And I love this story because here's a, a guy in the ranks who is getting his due. It says, at dress parade a few evenings since, the regiment was formed in a hollow square and Private Hart was called forward. The Major then complimented him on his soldierly bearing and courageous adventures, and in the name of the regiment, as a testimonial of their appreciation, presented him with a revolver of superior workmanship, a spyglass, a pocket compass, and a set of maps of the region and state of Virginia. Speeches were made afterwards, and it says, the, rep the report says, this we believe is the first instance in which a private has won by such complimentary notice from his regiment. So there you go, Benjamin B. Hart. Uh, unfortunately, this is where Second Bull Run comes in. He really didn't enjoy the honor um, for too long because in uh, 1862 in August, um, he was one of the folks who suffered a severe wound, in this case, his right leg. Um, an amputation was performed, and he succumbed to its effects. So uh, Benjamin B. Hart is part of a gallery that we've put together called Optics, which uh, is images, is photographs of men who have uh, field glasses, who have telescopes uh, with them in the photographs. So that is also part of the next issue of military images. So, um, also in military images, and as you saw at the, uh, at the outset of the program, is this advertisement for Gettysburg Publishing. Uh, Gettysburg Publishing, the owner uh, is uh, Kevin Drake, who's an awfully nice guy. Uh, if you've met him, uh, you know he's super generous, super kind, and um, uh, he publishes some fantastic books. Um, one of them here is the Gettysburg Campaign Atlas, uh, which is now available on their website. Uh, you can go look them up at uh, Gettysburg Publishing and um, take advantage of a newly revised version. If you're traveling the battlefields, uh, the battlefield of Gettysburg and all the locations on the battlefield, uh, I think it's fair to say that this is an indispensable uh, volume. So while I was talking to Kevin, uh, he mentioned to me that he, uh, he thought it would be interesting if uh, I was to share with folks a little bit about how some of the stories in uh, military images and how some of the photographs actually got to be there. So uh, I thought, well, Kevin, you're right. I don't really talk a lot about how the magazine comes together. So I thought tonight that I would tell all of you a little bit about um, uh, really three ways of how images make their way into the magazine. And I must say, uh, full disclosure, that um, uh, my motives are a little selfish here because I'm hoping that some of you tonight have some fantastic images that you've been waiting for the right opportunity to share. And uh, I hope that this motivates you to do so. So really there's three ways, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the segment, and uh, uh, it's really single images from the community, i.e. you. Uh, and those images can be single images, two, three, a handful of images. And um, some of you all send them to me through email, uh, sometimes you'll see me at Civil War shows, and I'll have uh, our trusty scanner set up, and I can make them at the show. Um, I meet some of you through social media, like here on Facebook, and we begin an exchange and talk about what you have. And uh, sometimes I'll offer a call to action to, uh, to ask for a specific subject matter. So um, probably the best example of uh, your images at work happened uh, last year in uh, our gallery 
uh, the Great American Civil War Cigar Gallery. Uh, I had collected a bunch of images. I put out a call to action. And uh, as many of you uh, may recall, we received a great outpouring of images, more than frankly could be used in, uh, the, vol in the issue. But we picked out about 25 and um, told their stories, told you about them and what they're wearing. So that was a fantastic example of the combination of uh, seeing you at shows, getting your emails, meeting you through social media, and, um, and then putting out the call to action. And uh, in fact, I want to put out a call to action tonight. And uh, this is a call to action that started really a couple years ago um, uh, at the Franklin Show. I began uh, searching for images of uh, Tennessee soldiers. And um, since then, I've amassed more than 50 uh, uh, soldiers, most of them identified from Tennessee. And uh, this is the year that we're going to do a gallery. We've really hit um, a pretty good number of images, but I'm still holding out for some more. So uh, if you've got a wonderful Tennessee image, uh, it can be an amazing uniform, some amazing content, uh, an identified soldier with a story to tell. I would love to hear from you. Um, we're pushing to get this gallery done by the end of the year. Uh, we're going to be making selections in the next few months. So if you've got something uh, from Tennessee, please let me know. The second way that, um, uh, that photographs come into the magazine, and certainly not, the, not, the, not second place, but just another way, is meeting with collectors. Uh, sometimes through email and at the shows, uh, they can be great ways to begin a conversation, but uh, it's not uncommon for me to travel and to meet collectors privately, uh, usually in their homes, but we can certainly do this elsewhere. Uh, if you're interested, if you've got a, a big collection or a very specific collection um, or some grouping of images that you think is uh, really quite interesting, I would love to get together with you and um, I can meet you. Uh, depending upon how far away you live from Arlington, Virginia, um, we can make plans to meet up somewhere and um, we can talk about what you have. We can talk about the possibilities. And one example I want to illustrate, uh, illustrate that is uh, Kevin Camberg, who um, last year we did a gallery of images and um, this is one of his wonderful images that showed up uh, on the cover. Um, the gallery that we did inside featured about 25 images from his collection, including this fantastic image. And so just so you know, um, I like to talk about the images, of course, uh, that's always first and foremost. But it's also important for me to want to talk about the collecting experience. Um, how did you come to be a collector? What I normally do is after we meet and after I do the scans, I'll follow up with an email, and that email will include anywhere from seven to 10 questions um, to find out more about you. And um, based on your answers to those questions, I'll create an introduction, which you can see a little bit of here. And that introduction helps to introduce you to the larger collecting community. Now, I wanna point out, this is not necessarily um, a place for you to, to brag or any of that. Um, although it's nice to be profiled in the magazine, I really am interested in sharing your collecting experience because when we think about the larger community collectors, the idea of sharing all the personal experiences that we've had, I think it's important to talk about that. And that actually becomes part of the history of the photographs uh, because these are, we're caretakers of these images. They're moving through our hands and someday someone else will have them. And um, uh, so it's important for us, I think, to pass along as part of the provenance of the images, your story and how you're connected to it. The third way uh, that we can do this is a story and image submission. Now, uh, some of you out there um, are writers, uh, are researchers, but maybe not completely confident about your writing skills. Uh, and um, uh, if you're interested in submitting a story, I certainly am wide open to receiving it. In fact, I probably have about 15 or 20 stories right now that uh, are in my, on my planning calendar for future issues. And I don't say that to intimidate you. Um, I actually say it as an encouragement. 
I would love to have you submit something. If you have a story that you want to tell about a story, a group of, of soldiers that were in a company, a regiment, sailors on a vessel, um, I'd love to talk about that with you. Um, and really it all starts with an email, um, a, per, a private message, um, a phone call, uh, our number is uh, on the site, and uh, we can have a conversation. And um, writing a story for the magazine is a collaborative experience. It's something that I work with you. Uh, we do a lot of back and forth, and um, I find it to be quite a bit of fun. And um, it's a great way to really explore a subject. So if you've got some thoughts about writing, and uh, if, the, if the writing muse strikes you, let me know and we can talk about that. A great example, a great recent example of that is uh, uh, Fred Taylor. You may have seen uh, his story uh, of one of Virginians, a journey um, from West Point to, uh, to the West in Texas. And um, Fred has contributed several times now. And um, uh, so he is uh, certainly a role model for, um, for the contributor. Great to work with Fred. So um, there's more um, we can talk about in sharing. So again, reach out to me if you've got anything at all to share and um, we can figure out um, how to get your submissions into the magazine. Next segment. I think it's fantastic. Uh, as Kurt Luther from Civil War Photo Sleuth will tell you, when an image is identified, and uh, this one was recently identified. Uh, this is part of the Lilinquist collection. Some of you may recognize it. Uh, these three previously unidentified uh, soldiers are sitting in front of a really interesting uh, backdrop. Uh, you can see uh, there's a tent over here. Um, there's a flag, what appears to be some sort of a palm tree uh, going on over here. Um, and it um, uh, looks like a um, fairly nondescript, maybe even a, a plank uh, piece of floor. So um, someone contacted the uh, Library of Congress, and I don't know the name of the collector, um, but I do know that uh, the gentleman on the left and the gentleman on the right uh, are both identified to the 75th New York Infantry. So the gentleman on the left is Thomas Nevins, and um, he was a blacksmith. You can see the resemblance is uh, quite clear. And then the gentleman on the right is Lester D. Wilson. And um, I'll pull him over so you can see uh, the likeness as well. So uh, you've got these two uh, gentlemen. What really makes it extra interesting to uh, the photo collector is take a look at the backdrop. It's the same exact backdrop. And because it's in a CDV, uh, which uh, wasn't reversed as the hard plate images are, we now see the palm tree and more of it on the opposite side. And we can still see the tent and a little bit of the flag. Uh, we also know that on the back of both of these images, the photographer is named. And he is uh, Jay Jones of the Rendezvous of distribu uh, Distribution in Virginia. So we now have a really fantastic clue. We can know that these guys were in Virginia um, at the rendezvous of distribution uh, and uh, had their photograph taken there. So if you've got tintypes or perhaps an ambrotype with the same backdrop, uh, now you know who the photographer is. So I've got a couple requests. Um, one of them is right here. This comes from Brett Schweinfurth. <coughs> Brett. Um, has identified, uh, recently picked up this coat, a wonderful uh, VRC coat that belongs to the gentleman picture here. And I'm going to go back and get this for you so you can see. Um, this is Lieutenant Andrew Winters of the 1st Tennessee Infantry. Speaking of Tennessee, 1st uh, Tennessee Infantry on the Union side. Uh, he later became a captain in the VRC. So that explains how we have his coat, and um, this image of Winters shows him at a post-war view. My guess here is probably uh, maybe in the, in the early 1870s, 
Uh, and so what Brett Schweinfurth is looking for is an image of Winters during the war. And although Brett didn't say this to me, I suspect he would love to have an image of uh, Andrew Winters as uh, a captain in the VRC wearing the same coat that uh, is now part of his collection. So I'll put this uh, in our comments field so you can see it. But if you've got a photograph of Lieutenant Andrew Winters, 1st Tennessee Infantry, later captain of the Invalid Corps or the VRC, uh, Brett wants to hear from you. I've got one more for you this evening. Some of you may have seen this image on uh, Doug York's um, Civil War Faces Facebook page. Uh, it was one of the most moving um, images that I've seen in a long, long time. Uh, it's a young boy who appears to have um, succumbed to some sort of illness. Uh, the family, perhaps I'm sure brothers and sisters, uh, are behind him. And in his hand is a photograph of some soldiers. Uh, Doug, by the way, calls them pips, photos in photos. And um, here's a close up of the photo. And um, it's hard to make out the detail. I'm gonna put this on Facebook so you can see it. But it looks to me like it's definitely three soldiers and they appear to be holding um, uh, rifles or muskets of some kind. Judging from where some of the hands are placed, I dare say they might be uh, carbines, but that's a guess. Um, but they're all wearing their caps. They all appear to be uh, dressed in fairly regulation uniform um, and holding their weapons all the same way across their chests. So uh, although it is blurry, it is, it's, it's a little bit of an unusual pose to have three men all holding their weapons in the same way. So would love to be able to identify this because uh, if we can know who this, uh, the folks are in this image, uh, then we might be able to find the identity of the little boy, who was certainly as much a part of the Civil War generation as the men pictured here. With that note, I'm going to leave you for the evening. Uh, our next program is going to be in a couple weeks. Uh, at that point, we'll be getting close up to the Gettysburg uh, Civil War show. And um, I'll have some news and information for you about that. So uh, stay tuned for the next episode of Military Images Live. And until then, I wish you happy hunting, safe travels, and great research. Take care and have a great night.